Girls, that was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Wonderful. And I am so happy about being here this morning. I've been looking forward to this. I've heard so much about your church, and uh, my family and I are just thrilled to be with you today. I, uh, I don't always get travel with Tammy and Morgan and Lauren and Grant, and so this is a treat for us. We've been in meetings down in North Carolina and uh, headed back to the Promised Land. We're living in Beckley, West Virginia, which is just a couple hours from here, and the other Virginia, right? And uh, we're excited about what the Lord is doing with our family and what He's led us to do. And I appreciate your prayers so very much. I love your pastor. He is my friend. And uh, let me just say two things. First of all, I don't like him because no preacher ought to be so talented as he is. I was sitting there, I didn't even know you played the harp. I didn't even know. Did you just pick that up last week or something? <laughs> That's a pretty amazing. And uh, secondly, let me say to you, you're a blessed church. I'm in churches all over the country and other countries. And uh, there are churches all over this world that would give anything to have the kind of pastor God has given you. And I mean that. And so you ought to be very grateful. And you ought to say, by the grace of God, as a church, we're just going to keep moving forward and see what the Lord will do in this place. And I'm excited for you. I mean that. I'm thrilled. Full house today on the first Sunday of the new year, which is wonderful. But I'm thinking here about your future and what God has planned. You know, God always has bigger plans than we do. You understand that, right? Because He's a big God. And He does exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or even think, according to His power that works in us, the Bible says. And so I'm praying for your church. And I would like to ask you to pray for us. We need your prayers and excited about the coming year and all that God has given us to do. Now let me just ask, how many of you would like to hear some great stories on your pastor from his college days? Would you raise your hand? Wow, that's a lot of people. <laughs> Well, you have to come back to the evening service tonight to hear that, right? <laughs> no, another time, perhaps, another time. No, he had a great testimony in school, and I thank the Lord for it. I want you to take the Word of God with me today and open it in the Old Testament to the Psalms, if you will. The Psalm 90. Psalm 90. And we'll break right into the middle of it in just a moment, but I'm going to ask you to keep your Bible open and follow along as I read the Word of God in just a moment. I was telling these children here along the front, these are some of the finest dressed people I've ever seen in my life in church. And I like it. And I love what you did with the children. To see these young people serving the Lord. It's great, great, great. May I say to all the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, God bless you for being in God's house on the Lord's day. You know, I, I grew up around old time religion. How many of you understand what I mean when I say that? Uh, my granddaddy was just an old mountain preacher in the hills of West Virginia, raw bone, leather lung peel the paint off the walls. I think he went through maybe the sixth grade. But he had God on him. And uh, not, not a lot of education, but he knew the Lord. Uh, he, uh, he got carried away preaching one night in the church. And uh, You know, preachers sometimes say things they ought not say. You understand that? And he said, bless God. That's what preachers say when they're about to say something they shouldn't say, usually. He said, bless God, there's two things no church needs. That's a clock on the wall and a busy-bodied woman, and this church has got both of them. That wasn't a good thing to say at all. <laughs> and he didn't stay in that church very long either, let me tell you. <laughs> and I'm not preaching that sermon this morning. Aren't you glad? <laughs> but I grew up around people that knew God. You understand what I mean by that? They knew the Lord. The Lord was real. Church wasn't just something they did on Sunday. And they didn't take a holiday from Jesus. They believed that every day belonged to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. In our world, we move so far from that. Even people who profess to be Christian people are so far removed from that. And I want to commend you for being here today to hear the Word of God and to begin this new year this way. Frankly, I cannot believe we're beginning 2017. Seems like yesterday the world was going to stop when it turned 2000. All of you remember that? And we all had our water and our food and our guns ready because it was all going to come apart at the seams. And here we are, 17 years later. Now, who knows how long we have? Only God knows that. That's right. but with that in mind, I bring you to Psalm 90 this morning, and we begin our reading in verse number 9, where the Bible says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten 
And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O, oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Now what I have just read with you is the oldest psalm in the Bible. As a matter of fact, when I say the Psalms, immediately everybody thinks about David, right? That sweet psalmist of Israel. I was sitting thinking about David a minute ago, listening to you play this harp. But Psalm 90 is not written by David. Psalm 90 is written by Moses. That goes back a ways. Yeah. Matter of fact, if you look at the title of just above verse number 1, it says, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. Right. In other words, this, this predates David's era by several thousand years, actually, hundreds at the very least, because we're going back to an occasion where Moses sits down and under inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes a prayer. Psalm 90 is a prayer. I've been meditating on this psalm, thinking much about it as I approach the new year. Uh, I'm not just interested in giving you a sermon this morning, frankly. Uh, anybody can stand up and give you uh, three points and a poem. I really care less that you even remember that. When I finish preaching, I want to give you something to think about, something to do, and something to pray. As a matter of fact, I'll just warn you, when I finish preaching and we come to the invitation, I intend to call on every person in this building to participate. Everybody. And if you say, I'm not doing that, then you've already made your decision. You know, sometimes when we approach the Word of God, we come like spectators. Mm -hmm. And even when we approach the preaching of the Word of God, the attitude in some places is, all right, preacher, impress us today. Teach us something today. Let me just say to you, the Spirit of the living God is in this place. And the words I've just read you, they're not my words. Look, you don't need to hear me today. We all need to hear the voice of God. Amen. There is a far greater preacher. And what is he saying to us? I want you to take your pen and mark something if you do this in your Bible, at least in, the, in your heart, I want you to have it marked. Look at verse number 9. When I stop, I want you to say the next word each time. Look at verse 9. For all our what? Days. Are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Would you circle in verse 9 days and then again in verse 9 years? How do you get to the years? By the days. You add up all the days. 2016 was a leap year. We actually had an extra day last year. Did you even know that? 366 days. This year we'll have 365 days. Actually, we don't know that we'll have 365 days. We may not even have two days. Right. This may be the only day any of us have. Only God knows how many days we have. But if you add all the days up, the days become years. Look at it again. Verse number 10. When I stop, say the next word. The what? The days, the days of our what? The years. Mm. Mark that in your Bible. The days of our years. Come to verse 12. So teach us to number our what? Days. Look at verse number 14. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our what? Days. Verse 15. Make us glad according to the what? Days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the what? Years wherein we have seen evil. This is interesting to me. You know how we measure our life? We measure our life by years. Someone kindly said to me this morning in this meeting, I expected you to be an older man. And I said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, this year I turned 40. And uh, I was preaching in a youth meeting sometime back, and I said something about being young. We got in the car. How many of you know your wife can say something that no one else can say to you? We got in the car, and we're driving along quietly, and my wife said to me, she said, you did good preaching tonight. And I said, thank you. And she said, there is one thing you said you probably want to stop. And I said, what's that? She said, to all those kids, you're not young anymore. And it might be good if you didn't refer to yourself that way. And I'm crossing the threshold. I'm now 
middle age, they say. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, age is all relative, isn't it? I met a dear brother in here today who's 90 years of age, still going strong, singing in your choir. And I say, hallelujah. If Jesus tears his coming, I hope I have that kind of energy in another 50 years. That's an amazing thing to me. My wife's grandmother in Michigan, we just returned from her birthday party. She just turned 100. That's a big one, let me tell you. And still going strong. But the truth of the matter is, we measure life by our years. As a matter of fact, we have a time every year that we celebrate the passing of another year. We call it a what? A birth what? That's interesting, isn't it? A birthday. There is a day that commemorates the passing of another year. Now watch, stay with me please. I'm going to show you something. We measure life by the years that we live. If I say to somebody, how, how old are you? Or tell me about so and so. They say, oh, he's about. And they say, a certain number of years. But listen to me please. God does not measure time by years. To be truthful with you, God's not even in time. Time is in God. That'll blow your mind. God's not bound by time. With God, there is no past, present, and future. He's in the eternal now. He's not the I was or the I shall be. He is the I what? Am. He is the ever-present one. He is Alpha Omega, beginning and end, first and last. He knows the end from the beginning. It's all the same to God. God's the one who created time. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 5, He's the one who set up this basic unit of life when he said the evening and the morning were the first what? Day. Interestingly enough, if you fast forward to the last page of the Bible, to Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 5, the Bible says that there's going to come a time when God's going to make it so there are no more night, there is no more night, and there's no more change of days. We're going to enter in, think of this, we're going to cross out of this life into a world where it is one eternal day. Study your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. What is God's emphasis? God's emphasis is not on the years of your life. God's emphasis is on the days of your life. That's why it says, today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. Today, he said to the thief, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Did you ever think about God's emphasis on the days of your life? Now, why is that significant? Please hear with your heart. Because every day matters. Every day. See, we think in these big sweeping things about life. We think of the years of our life. We think of the big events of life. We think of the extraordinary moments in life. Listen to me, please. Your life is not made up of big events and extraordinary moments. Your life is made up of lots of ordinary days. But like a big jigsaw puzzle are all pieced together by a mighty God. And God's desire and design is that every day count. And can I just tell you, I'm going to testify for a minute. I'm preaching to me this morning. I see, I've been convicted over the last few days. I've been thinking about the years of my life and something dawned on me a few weeks ago. That in every year of my life, these 40 years, there have been some days I have wasted. Let's just take a survey. It's the season for polls, isn't it? How many of you know there have been days you've wasted? Yeah. More than I care to think about. And frankly, the Holy Spirit's been working on this preacher, on me. Can I tell you my prayer for 2017? I've prayed that somehow, some way, God would make it this year that I would not waste a single day. Not a day. Now, in the end, only God can judge that. In the end, only God truly knows that. In the end, only God really knows a man's heart. I don't even know my own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't even know your own heart. But my prayer for my life this year, and I'm sharing it with you this morning because I hope it will be the prayer you have for your life and for your family and for this church, is that not one single day of this year that God has graciously given to us will be wasted on ourselves. Not a single day. I have on my study desk at home, in a prominent place where I can see it, an hourglass. It was given to me by my family at a big event. When I think of 
see that hourglass, I think of that event, I think of my family, but it's come to mean more to me than that. It's a reminder of time and how quickly it goes. You know how life disappears? One day at a time. You know how you make it count? One day at a time. <coughs> The other day I was in my study. I'd never paid much attention to it. But I was doing something and I turned the hourglass over. And I thought, when that's up, then I'll know how much time has elapsed. I was busy doing the things I was doing and I looked up and all the sand had fallen through, every bit of it. I looked, I looked at that and I didn't have a watch with me, didn't have my phone with me and so I left my study and I walked around the corner and I peered around and I looked at a clock and I thought, well that's not an hourglass because an hour had not passed. As a matter of fact, that little hourglass only marks 15 minutes. And I thought to myself, what an interesting thing because there are times in life where we're thinking about the big segments. I'm going to make 2017 count. Are you really? Can I tell you how to make the whole year count? Give every day to God. Amen. Every day. By the way, may I commend you? You're off to a good start. You're in the Lord's house or the Lord's people hearing the Word of God on the Lord's day. That's a good start. Now let me tell you what you've got to do tomorrow. You've got to give tomorrow to God. Amen. And then the next day you've got to give up and you've got to give that day to God. As somebody once said that the hourglass not only reminds us that time is fleeting, but what's in the hourglass? What's in the hourglass, church? Sand. Excuse me. Dust. And they fittingly said the hourglass reminds us that in the end that's what we're all going back to. God made man of the dust to the ground. Would you look at your neighbor a moment, everyone please? Would you stare at the person sitting next to you just for a second? Some of you sat next to the wrong person, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Would you look at them please for a moment? You know what you're looking at? A ball of dust, that's what you're looking at. You say, well that's not a nice thing to say, it's true. It may be a ball of dust with nice clothes on or makeup on or beautiful hair or no hair at all. But anyway you slice it, God made man of the dust of the ground, look breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. But wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. In the end the dust shall return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Now I sat here and listened to the story of this 17 year old girl and frankly I thought about my daughter Morgan, 17. And I thought we never know, do we? We all want to live to be 90. <laughs> And we all want to live a long life, but in the end, can I tell you what your life is? Your life's a short story. As a matter of fact, would you look back at what we read in verse number 9? The Bible says, we spend our years as a tale that is told. Would you mark that in your Bible? You know what everybody wants their tale to be? They want it to be an eight-volume hardback set. That's what they want it to be. A long story. Hear me, church. Your story, my story, even if you live to be a hundred, will not be a long story. It will be a short story. And this world is not your long home, it's your short home. May I illustrate? See this dot right here? Right here. That's your birth. And this little line right here, that's your life. And this dot, that's your death. Let's review. Here's your birth. Here's your life. Here's your death. Somebody says, that's not long enough. I'm sorry. The Bible says life's like a hand breadth. It's like what your pastor read earlier. It's a vapor. It comes and it goes. So here's your birth. Here's your life. Here's your death. Watch. And here. Here's eternity. How far you want me to go? <laughs> Truth is, if I ran around your church a hundred times, that'd be fun to watch, wouldn't it? <laughs> it still would be an imperfect illustration. You know why? Because there's no end to eternity. That's right. So I want to ask you something. While you're thinking about the new year, God's thinking about eternity. And I want to ask you, if that is true, that's what the Bible teaches, then tell me please why we give so much of our energy and so much of our time and so much of our affection and so many of our resources to this and so little to this. 
So you want to make the most of your year? So you want to make it count for eternity? There's only one way to do that, and that is you've got to give every day to God. The Christian life is not lived one day a week. The Christian life is not some experience, something we dress up for and come put on. The Christian life is not what's done in public. The Christian life is following Jesus Christ and yielding to the control of the Holy Spirit every single day. Amen. And I think it's interesting when you read through Psalm 90, this repeated emphasis on the days of our years, the days, the days, the days, the days. I don't know how you grew up, but where I grew up in the hills, if Mama said it once, I was supposed to listen. If she said it twice, I was really supposed to listen. And if she had to say it three times, it was too late to listen. You understand what I mean by that? It wasn't good. Look, when God says something over and over again, it's not because He forgot He said it the first time. It's because He's trying to put it so deep in our hearts that we will not forget it. And so what should we learn about the days of our years? I'll give you three simple thoughts very quickly, and they all come from this passage. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, All our days are passed away in thy wrath. The first thing that the Spirit of God shows me from Psalm 90 is the passing of my days. They come and they go. If you look down to verse number 10, the Bible says the days of our years are three score years and ten. You might write in the margin of your Bible, that's 70 years. And then he says, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, that's 80 years. So think of this, even in Moses' day, everybody lived longer in Moses' day, right? But even in Moses' day, Moses said, if you live to be 70 or if you live to be 80, that's pretty good. That's interesting, isn't it? And then he says this, would you look please at the last phrases of verse 10, it is soon cut off and we fly away. The little country church where I grew up, we used to sing that song, I'll fly away. You know the song? It's not sung much anymore, but the truth of the matter is that's exactly what you're going to do. Look, you're going to step out of one world and into the next in a moment. And by the way, it may not happen through death. It may happen through the return of Christ. Do you understand Jesus might come while I'm preaching this morning? You want to talk about a glorious new day, new year. The trump might sound. I wouldn't even have to drive back to Beckley. We'd just go, all go up in the clouds together. That'd be wonderful. You know what's going to happen Sunday? Sunday you're going to fly away. This world is fleeting, and the days are short and soon gone. Let's imagine. Let's imagine I gave you $25,520. How many of you take it? I'm sure you would. Don't you lie in church. <laughs> $25,520. Somebody says, that's a lot of money. Well, let's put it in perspective. You've got to pay taxes, right? You're going to tithe on it. You better. <laughs> and the time you tithe and pay your taxes, you don't have nearly as much you started with. And then you start spending. Oh, we like to spend, don't we? Yeah. Even those of us that like to save, we have to spend because you've got to live. A young person might say, $25,520, Brother Scott, that's going to last me a long time. <laughs> and those of us who've lived a while are going to laugh and say, no, probably not. You know what's funny? When you have $25,520, man, you can spend it because you've got plenty, don't you? You don't even think much about it. Oh, what's $5? I've got $25,515 more. And then you get over here. And you look at your account, and you've got $10 left. And you think, hmm, where'd all that go? Do you know the average American lives 25,520 days? Now don't start figuring. I know what some of you are doing right now. <laughs> Getting your calculator out. You know the scary thing about this? You can figure up how many days you've lived, but you can't figure up how many days you have left. Wow. Because only God knows your appointment. Yeah. But now wait a minute. Let's, let's imagine, for sake of illustration, you get 25,520 days to live. You know what's funny? When you're young, you're just burning through them. You don't even think much about it. You get up in the morning, you do your thing, you run through life, you run wide open, you got more energy than a little bit. 
we were trying to go to bed last night in the hotel room. And our kids, they were wired for sound, let me tell you. It was the new year, you know. And uh, they, were, they were excited about it. I'm glad. And I thought as I was semi-comatose, boy, I wish I had that energy right now. <laughs> and then you get near the end and you start looking in your wallet and you realize, I don't have many days left. Where'd they go? Did you know every day you live is like a dollar spent? We spend our years as a tale that is told. Let me ask you a personal question. What are you going to do with today's dollar? Nothing you can do to go back and change the old ones. Nothing. Nothing. Can't go back and recoup what you've already wasted. But what will you do with today? And what will you do with every day of this year? What will you do with every day from this day forward? What will you do with the rest of the days of your life? Can I tell you the greatest day a man ever lives? The day he sees Jesus face to face. Amen, brother. Can I encourage you? That means your greatest days are still ahead of you. I had a man come up to me yesterday in North Carolina. He's up in years. He was a pastor for years, a very well-known man, well-respected man. And he said to me almost sadly, he said, I'm just trying to figure out what to do now. And I said to him, can I tell you something, sir? I, I've never lived the season you're in, but somebody once told me the prime of life is the center of God's will. And if you're in the middle of God's will right now, you're in the prime. And God's got big things planned for you. I believe that. Can I tell you, for a Christian, the best is always yet to come. Amen. And the greatest day you're ever going to live is going to be the day you see Jesus face to face. And I'm going to tell you something. Whether you have a good day on that day or not is dependent on what you do with these days. Because these days are passing. There's a second truth I want to show you from Psalm 90. Look further down in the Psalm to verse number 12. Notice the second occasion where he talks about these days. He says in verse 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Number two, would you write this down? This is the priority of our days. You know the funny thing about the new year? Everybody's reflective, aren't they? They're thinking about what they should have done better last year, what they're going to try to do better this year. And so there's a little time of reflection. I think that's good. Frankly, I think the week between Christmas and New Year is one of the most profitable times of the year for me. Because in the parenthesis, I'm thinking and praying about what needs to be adjusted. We even did this last night before we prayed together as a family. I went around the circle and I said, all right, everybody tell me something you're praying for for the new year. And I was just interested to hear what everybody had to say. And we laughed a little and cried a little and had a good time and prayed together. The truth of the matter is, I think every last one of us ought to have pauses in life where we say, look, what needs to be adjusted? And by the way, your pastor can't do that for you. I'm sorry, but your spouse can't even do that for you. You have to do that for you. How do you do it? The Bible says, you teach us, Lord, teach us to number our days. Let me get serious. Let me get sober-minded. With all the frivolity and all the lightness and all, all the flippancy, most people laugh their way through life only to get sober at the end. And I want to say to you, let's get sober now before the end. Yes. If, if something matters for eternity, it ought to matter today. So teach us to number our days. Why? Here's what we do. That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Can I tell you what Scott Pauly needs more desperately than anything in this world this year? I need wisdom. Would you pray for me? I mean that. Would you pray for me? I need wisdom. Where to go? What to say? What to give my energy to and what not to. Isn't that the hardest thing to do in life? What to eliminate? Can't do everything. I need wisdom to be a better husband. I need wisdom to be a better father. I need wisdom from God. Look, it all comes from God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Can I tell you what you ought to pray for your pastor? Wisdom. And I tell you what you ought to be praying right now for your life, for this new year. God, give me wisdom to order my days. Give me wisdom to guide my family. Give me wisdom to make right decisions. Give me wisdom to stay out of the things you don't want me tangled up in. Give me wisdom to keep my own heart right with God. I'm going to tell you the most difficult thing to do in life. Keep yourself right with God. My biggest enemy you're looking at right now and I see him every morning when I get up in the mirror. Would you back up to verse number 8? It's a convicting verse. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, 
our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Did you know God knows you? Way down deep below the surface right now, God knows you. Can I ask you a probing question? Is there anything right now you need to confess? Is there anything between you and God? Anything. Charles Tindley was the son of a slave. Nobody thought much about little Charles. He swept the floors in a big, beautiful downtown church in Philadelphia as a boy, and all those fine, rich, well-dressed people walked past him every Sunday and never thought about him until he grew up and became the pastor of the church. One day, Charles Tenley sat down with a pen and piece of paper and wrote words that I love to sing, Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not of this world's delusive dreams. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. Let nothing between. And I'm asking you right now, on the threshold of a new year, of the first day, the first Lord's Day of 2017, is there anything in your heart between you and God? I don't have to tell you. Because the Holy Ghost just did. There may be someone here today that doesn't even know God. You're not ready for heaven. If that young lady we'd talked about and prayed for a family a moment ago had been you, you, you wouldn't be ready to meet God. Then today you ought to make the priority. I want to be right with the Lord. Some have been saved for a while. Frankly, some people have been saved for 50 years are stuck 30 years ago. Now, if you ask them for their testimony, they say, I've been saved 50 years. Wonderful. But the truth of the matter is, 30 years ago, they drew a line with God, and they said, that's as far as I'm going. And they stopped. And I'm asking you, if the days of your life are passing like mine are, and if soon we're going to stand face to face with the Creator God of the universe and kneel at the nail-pierced feet of Jesus, what ought you to do today? I'm sorry, but the priority of my life is not, a, is not a nicer place to live or more money or a longer vacation or a better retirement. The priority of my life has to be getting ready for eternity. And that's the priority of your life. There's the passing of my days. There is the priority of my days. But then, oh, I lead you here. Please see where I'm at. Look at verse 14. Notice how the prayer ends. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad. What church? All Let's vote on it. How many of you would like all your days to be good days this year? Amen. Let me tell you how, you how it happens. Early on, you get fresh mercy. Early. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. This is the prayer for our days. I'm going to pray for your church. I mean that. How shall I pray? I don't know your church. First time I've ever been here. I don't know the people in this room. How shall I pray for you? I can pray the Word of God for you. See, when you're praying His words, you always know you're praying His will. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this prayer and I'm going to pray that this church will have the mercy of God on it. That this church will have the joy of Jesus in it. That this church will know the presence of God in an unusual way. Wouldn't it be glorious to see a real sweeping revival in your community? Amen. Wouldn't it be great if this were the year that God just turned it all upside down? And people all over this area say, I don't know what's going on over there at that church, but God has showed up there. Oh, read on. Look at the rest of the prayer, verse 16. Let thy work appear unto thy servants. Would you like to see God work this year? Wouldn't you love to witness the work of the Lord among you? Some of you right now, you've got a burden. Something in your life, something in your family, and you think it's beyond anything that's fixable. Listen to me. God is able. Let Him work. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, watch this one, and thy glory unto their children. I was riding along in a car this week with a man who's been an evangelist for nearly 40 years. We were preaching together and talking about revival and the work and move of God. And I said to him, we were talking about great, great days and previous generations. I said, you know what's really sad? Most young people in America now have never even seen a revival. They've never even seen one. They've heard about it. They've read stories. 
I'm thinking of my own children. I want the glory of God to be known to them. I want them to know God for themselves, to love Christ passionately, to hear the voice of the Spirit prompting them to know the leading of God in their lives. Oh, pray for the children and the teenagers and the young single adults in this church that they will know the glory of God. I thank the Lord for all of the seniors in this church and some of you have served God for a long time. And by the way, your work's not over and God's work in you is not over. But you hear me. If Jesus tarries His coming, the only way this church can move forward is if another generation of young couples and young families and young people step up and stand up and take their place as followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to pray for our church. And that's what we need to pray for our families. Notice how the prayer ends, verse 17. I love it. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Oh, there's a beauty this world can't give, and hallelujah, the world can't take it away. It grows with age. It's the beauty of God. I saw an elderly woman the other day, well up in years, and I looked at her and I thought, she's one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen. Somebody says, well, that's strange. Oh, no, it was, it was different. It was the beauty of the Lord upon her. Oh, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Read it. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Don't you love how it moves from God's work to our work? I want God to work in me so I can work for Him. And this is the prayer for the days of my year. My pastor for 20 some years a spiritual mentor to me and to your pastor, a great man, a great Christian. Pastor Sexton testified years ago, and I've never forgotten it. Matter of fact, it stuck in my mind, just stuck in my mind. The day he and Miss Evelyn got married, they were married, and he said, we had a very serious conversation, and he said, I said to my wife that day, I gazed in her eyes, and I said to her, sweetheart, we don't have one day to waste. When I was preparing to preach to you this morning, that came to my mind. Church, we don't have one day to waste. They said when Queen Victoria of England was dying upon her deathbed, she wept and she said, I would give all of my wealth for one more moment of time. Makes you think, doesn't it? That in the end, what we have lived for and labored for sometimes really doesn't matter. And the only thing that truly matters is God and eternity. Amen, brother. And so today I give you something, something to meditate on. It's the passing of our days. Something to do. Consider the priority of your days. And something to pray. O oh Lord, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Father, I thank you for the Spirit of the living God. And I thank thee, Lord, for the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. And I pray that at this moment, all over this room, the Lord might do His work. And I pray that we'll respond. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. In a moment, I'm going to point to the pianist and I've asked her to play a particular hymn. But before she does, I'd like to ask a question or two. How many of you know if you met God in the next 60 seconds, you're ready? You say, Preacher, I've been saved. I really have been born again. I know what you're talking about. My sins are forgiven. Christ is mine. I'm ready. I'd like you to lift your hand toward heaven as a testimony of that fact. I'd like you to keep it up a moment. And with your hand lifted toward God, I'd like you to just thank the Lord right where you are for a moment. Let's begin with gratitude. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What a wonderful Savior. Never perish. <laughs> oh, bless His holy name. You may lower your hands. 
you're here today and you couldn't raise your hand with confidence. You're not sure. You have some doubt about it. I'm going to give you my word on something. I'm not going to embarrass you. I didn't come to embarrass anybody. I love you and I'm praying for you and I want to pray for you. And if a moment ago you could not raise your hand with confidence, I'd like to ask you to be honest again. Would you be honest with yourself and with this preacher? And most of all, would you be honest with God? He already knows. It's dangerous to lie to the Holy Spirit. Who among us today would say, Preacher, if I died and met God in the next 60 seconds, I don't know for sure that my sins are forgiven and that Christ is in me and that my name is written down in heaven. But I, I know this, I don't want to be lost and I don't want to go to hell forever. Brother Scott, I'm concerned enough about my soul to ask you this morning, would you pray for me? No one else is looking. I'd like you to lift your hand in the air with mine quickly, long enough for me to see it. I see you, and you, and you, I see you. If you just raised your hand, I'd like to ask you just to lift your head and look at me. No one else is looking. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know you. I don't know any of you. And nobody's told me about any of you. That's good. <laughs> All I can tell you is what God told me, and that is the Lord loves you. And His Son died for your sins and was buried and rose from the dead so you could have eternal life. Do you believe that? Do you? Yes? you believe that? That all that is required is that we put our faith in Christ. Sir, ma'am, would you put your faith in Christ today? Would you believe, I'm talking about right where you sit, would you be willing today to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and leave this meeting with the assurance that you're one of His children? If that's what you want, I want to give you an opportunity right where you sit right now to call on Him. Let's not waste a moment. We don't have a moment to waste. Jesus could come any moment. He could call for us any moment. I'm going to give you a verse. Whosoever, that's you, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Amen? Then would you call on Him now? If you will, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And I'd like to lead you in a simple prayer. And I'm going to ask right now, would you pray this prayer from your heart to God? He alone can answer this prayer. Make it your own. Put your faith in Him. If you need Jesus right now, would you just simply say, Dear God, I'm a sinner. And if I get what I deserve, I would not go to heaven. I need Jesus. I believe He's the only Savior. That He died for my sins. And I trust Him now. Come into my life. Forgive me. And give me a clean heart. Take me to heaven when I die. Thank you for dying for me. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. The Bible says if a person truly believes on Christ, they'll not be ashamed of it. I believe that. If I gave you a million dollars today, you'd be excited, not ashamed. If you just called on God to forgive your sin, He gave you eternal life. That's better than a million dollars. And I don't believe you'll be ashamed of it. If today you prayed that simple prayer with this preacher and called on the Lord and you're trusting Him as your Savior right where you sit to settle once and for all your eternal destiny, you say, Preacher, I prayed that prayer, I meant it from my heart, and I am trusting Christ. I'd like you to lift your hand in the air with mine. Keep it up just a moment. Would you hold it in the air? Keep it high so I can see it. I want the pastor to see. He knows you. He loves you. That's thrilling. I see you, young man. It's wonderful. Wonderful. If you just raised your hand, I'd like to ask you to lift your head and look at the platform just for a moment. I'm excited for you. And you, and you, it's wonderful. It's great. It's very good. Here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to ask lots of people to come and pray. I don't want you to get lost in that shuffle. I'm going to ask the pastor, if he would, to come stand right here at the front, in front of the pulpit. While nobody's looking around, I'm going to ask you if you would just come right now and just shake his hand and tell him, I got it settled today. Would you come? Come on right now. The pastor's going to meet you right here. Just come tell him, I got it settled today once and for all. I prayed that simple prayer. 
I placed my faith in Christ and Christ alone for my soul's salvation. Wonderful. Wonderful. Who else? Praise God. If you're a Christian, this ought to make your soul rejoice. Next to your own salvation, nothing more exciting than seeing somebody else get saved, is there? Is there anyone else who say, I prayed, I called on God. You come tell us. Don't be ashamed of it. Maybe you raised your hand and you're not sure still. You're not sure. I'm going to ask you, would you just come? The pastor's here at the front. Would you just come take him by the hand and say, I need to talk with you? We won't embarrass you. We're not going to make you give a speech. Let somebody show you from the Bible how to be saved and how to have your sins forgiven. You that came today, I'm just going to ask you to sit here along the front if you don't mind for a moment because we want to recognize you in a minute. I'm thrilled. Now here's my invitation. There may be others who have spiritual needs. The pastor's here. Maybe you need to join this church. If I lived here, I'd be a member of this church. You come tell him. Maybe you're a Christian. You're not right with God. need to get some things right. You come. Let him pray with you. He'd be happy to do that. But my invitation today is going to be a little different. I'm just going to tell you right up front because it's for everybody. I told you that a while ago. So here's my invitation. We're going to close the meeting today in an old-fashioned prayer meeting. We're going to pray for ourselves. We're going to pray for our families, our children, our grandchildren. We're going to pray for this church. We're going to take Psalm 90 and make it our prayer. If you say, I don't even know what to say, then just bring your Bible and pray Psalm 90. That'd be fine. We're going to pray for mercy. We're going to pray for the joy of the Lord. We're going to pray for the beauty of God to be on us. We're going to pray that we'd see God at work. We're going to pray that the Lord would establish the work of our hands this year. We're going to pray that God will help us make every day count. Now, some of you may not be physically able to come and kneel. And if you're not, God understands that. You can stay right where you are and make your pew your altar and pray right where you are. But I think it would be good if you're physically able if you could make an effort to leave your seat and come join us here in this old-fashioned altar and either kneel or stand or sit along the front, and we're going to have a dedication prayer together on the first Sunday of the new year. Wouldn't it be great to start the new year this way? Giving ourselves to God and asking the Lord to help us make every day count. Here's what's going to happen. In just a moment, I'll point to our sister, and I've asked her to play a little of I Need Thee Every Hour. Most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. And I'm going to ask when she hits the first note on the piano, if you want in on this prayer, and this is in your heart, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and come join us in this altar. You may want to bring your family, bring your children, and say, let's pray together. But right now, as the Spirit of God moves, you obey the Lord. She begins to play. Would you come right now? Amen. Some of you may be able to even come up on the platform to pray, make room for others. Wonderful. Wonderful. I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. When you've come as far as you can, just find a place there in the aisle to pray. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. Now she just plays a little of it. Could we unite our hearts? Agree in prayer? Would you pray right now for mercy? For fresh mercy.
for you, for your loved ones. Some of you are praying for a lost loved one right now. Or a wayward child. Pray for mercy. Would you pray for fresh gladness? That's the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength this year. Oh, make us glad, Lord. Give us happy homes. A joy-filled church. Keep the devil out. May God have his way. May the Spirit of the living God have liberty to do what he wants to do in this place. Pray that we might see the work of the Lord this year. The work of the Lord. Would you pray for your church right now? Just pray for your church. Pray for souls. Pray for revival. Could I ask you to pray for your pastor right now by name? Ask God to gird him up and strengthen him. Could we pray the last verse of Psalm 90? Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Now, Lord, I want to thank you for what you're doing at this moment in our hearts, in this place. I thank you for precious ones who've come to Jesus today. Oh, what a glorious thing. Hallelujah. They're rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. We join the rejoicing, Lord. We bless you. I pray for young and old alike all over this auditorium praying now. Oh, Father, make this the greatest, grandest, most glorious year we have ever known. One day at a time. Help us, Lord, to make every day count and not waste one. Help us to live every day in thy presence as surely as we're in your presence at this moment. Father, I want to pray that you'll keep your hand on this pastor. That you'll lead him and guide him and fill him with the Holy Spirit. And use him, Lord, in a mighty way to lead this church. And I pray for these precious people. What a sweet church. Thank you for allowing our paths to cross. May the blessing of the Lord be upon them. Lord, if you tear your coming, I pray this time next year, this church will be able to testify of the most fruitful, God-blessed year it's ever known. And Lord, would you put a hedge about them, around every family, and around this church family, so not one of them will go away from thee. And Father, for thousands outside this building who need Jesus, may this be the year of their salvation. Do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to your power that works in us. Thank you for a new year, for another day. We give it back to you, knowing you can do more with it than we can. In Jesus' name, amen.